Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. everybody. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. I am here with my brother from another mother, Ty Stubblefield. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. My fellow former Oregonian. Form, both formers. <laughs> we both made the decision for mass exodus from that state. I You're saw it coming four years in advance. Yeah, you made the jump probably when I Two, should have made the jump. 2015 would have been the year. Yeah. But, you know. But my real estate investment that I did over the last five years really was was worthwhile staying for, I think. Right. So everything happens for a reason. I firmly believe in that. Yeah. For everything in life. I'm Sometimes you don't know why or what, but it, it is a reason and eventually will come to light. Yeah. Yes. So for all of you watching and those of you listening, there's a lot going on here. Um, we are at Total Archery Challenge in Big Sky, Montana. We're at the Bear Archery slash Trophy Ridge booth. I have not seen Ty. I'm trying to remember the last time I saw it. It was at Sheep Show. Sheep Show two year two Three. Years, two years ago. It was two. Sure? Nope. It's two. Okay. Ir- irrelevant. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. You've been out of the game for a while. You were single. I'm now married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the first time you got to meet my husband yes which is so everybody weird everybody on the interwebs knows he's your husband because i think you posted that like no less than five thousand times about my him being my husband yeah do i say the word husband too much a lot am i supposed to just be like this guy <laughs> i'm hanging out with every day <laughs> <laughs> i bet him on tinder i think you were so I swiped ex- right <laughs> you were so excited for so long that it was just husband 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 me and my husband me and my husband it was cute we loved it, we loved it. but even yeah. my daughter hunter was like did you see that that christy posted about her husband again <laughs> You're like, I'm going to kill her. I know. We're like that disgusting was, couple that everybody awesome. hates. It was it's, great. It's really gross. It's just, Sorry about it's, that. Oh, it's just fun to have something to poke poke you with. I mean, yeah, you know, poke I mean, fun of yes. apart from everything else that's so <laughs> obvious and easy to make fun of. I'm trying to go back like in memory how I met you. Oh, goody. Can we get to tell that story? Oh, I don't know if I want to do this right now. I'm a little nervous, but yes, <laughs> tell the story because I don't remember. So we met at the very first, um, and I forget what it was you called. You have an evil look in your eye when you're just like, I'll Ooh. leave. I'll leave some of the good stuff out <laughs> to protect you because I'm your brother. I'll leave just enough for curiosity's sake. But... Uh, so it was the very first, I forget what it was called, but Cody and... Full Draw Film... There, film no, no, school. no, the Film School. Yeah, yeah that's what it was. Full Draw Film School. And there was like... I was with Josh. There was like 19 dudes and, and Christy. And me. <laughs> and I was like super impressed because... And I knew who you were, but we had never met. And uh, I just remember being like, holy shit, she can hang. Like, you get 19 dudes in a room and one chick, like, there's no... Nobody's holding anything back. And you just rolled with it. Like, in fact, I think you made most of them blush. It was pretty fun. You actually, uh, Ty, so the whole premise of this film school is you make a mini film and edit it and you work through the process and kind of, you're supposed to be getting coached along the way. Yeah. And Ty did like a shirtless bed scene. Yes. What was the deal you were doing? I don't even remember what your commercial was about. I don't either. But I was naked in bed. Yeah, and then he has like this full <laughs> camera crew come in first. They're doing like a hunting film, and Ty somehow finagles a shirtless bed scene. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so fitting, so yeah, fitting. That's how I roll. And actually, my scene, I pretended to be married to Josh. Yeah, which, uh, which was really funny because we had to do some hand holding scenes, and he was fully married to your um, my daughter stepdaughter, mm-hmm. <laughs> and so that was like kind of awkward. We didn't like have a makeout scene. 
scene or anything like that. Let me just clarify. It was just the far as it went was a handhold scene. Which, for the record, if it had been you and me, we would have made out. <laughs> in, in the bed. <laughs> Shirtless bed scene. Good Lord. I do believe I tried getting you to come in bed with me. I but don't you weren't, remember. You weren't wanting to be a... Uh, fill in i wasn't i wasn't going there when we don't play that uh that was a fun weekend i that was um so that had to have been nine years ago oh i i'm not even going to take a stab at that yeah yeah it had but to have been at like least nine, yeah nine ten maybe years yeah. ago um so yeah that and then i don't know what happened along the way there but somehow we all became like if I it's have an birds hour, of a feather. Well, what, I'll get on the phone with you, and it's like, I don't shut up for an hour. <laughs> I don't know what happens. Like, I black out. <laughs> I'm like, on the phone, I just, well, that happens all the time anyway when I start talking, so. You like to talk, which is why we're podcasting. I like to talk, which so is it's good Well, times. and so you and Josh had shooting the Bull podcast, mm-hmm. which was super off the wall, like, fun podcast you guys just like literally had no boundaries left right up or down it and we don't anyth- and we don't edit no <laughs> it takes too much time everything <laughs> was in the podcast <laughs> you guys were just like okay we're gonna just tell it all good bad ugly yeah it's going and for that for that podcast i shut it down actually shut it down I, I, if i looked i want to say it's been a year and a half but if i actually look it's probably been two over two um but we uh i look out coming in hot um i started a bison ranch like i quit my day job and started a bison ranch and so that was just a lot of stuff and so i i just shut it down i didn't have time to mess with it but so that i am gonna fire that back up yeah you should so it'll be a little different um but yeah we're gonna fire that back up but so i don't want to jump ahead too far we're, yeah you just would you catapulted just now yeah so for the for the back story for those of you who don't that don't know ty you you know grew up in oregon you were like this western hunter you know pretty badass elk hunter you 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 get it done and i won't i won't go too far forward on how awesome you are with a bow with elk because with that we're going to save that one little nugget for a minute um but you guys grew up you know you were hunting logging roads roosevelt elk you know getting your tail kicked in some of the toughest elk hunting conditions i would say in the country yeah, we, you know, we grew up in Western Oregon, Roosevelt hunting, because that's what we could afford to do, you know. Well, and that's what you had in your and backyard. That's what was in your backyard, and, you know, you weren't, we weren't taking months off to go hunting kind of thing. No. It was weekend warrior stuff. And, and Day jobs and evenings and stuff. And, and You guys were like the inventors <clears throat> of the guys riding bikes. Like straight up bicycles. Yeah. This wasn't this e-bike thing going on. You actually had to pedal your bike. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm actually going to take the credit for... I, I can't say that I'm the pioneer by any means because lots of guys older than me were doing that. But in in Western Oregon, there's um, a lot of private timberland that is open to hunt. It, you, at least in the past, it was. I mean, lots changed since then. But back in the day, OG stuff, you could hunt these private timberlands. So you couldn't camp. You couldn't camp, and you had to you had to hike in behind the gate. You couldn't drive in. There's no motorized access. And you had to go in and out in one day. Yeah. So in order to cover a lot of country, which you have to do when you're elk hunting, we um, I started using mountain bikes long before the born and raised days. Yeah. Um, But I just couldn't get anybody dumb enough to go with me, so I was always by myself. But it enables you to access a lot more country in a shorter period of time. And then if you are successful, it enables you to get it out faster and yeah. easier as well you know you're not putting all that pressure on your back and your hips and body knees and feet and mm-hmm. toes so he, he touched on born and raised you you were part of born and raised for a number of years and that was kind of you know we we're a big part of that and, yeah. and helped grow that brand into what it is today and and uh, but when you moved to montana obviously you know there's always a transition in life when, when you move to another state there's always a trade-off in lifestyle and you know yogi and i are going through that now and for you it was okay well i'm going to leave oregon behind and you, you moved into a different phase of life and and now now you've got the wild bison ranch you've like you're just you've changed so much in in 10 years it's unbelievable <laughs> um i can't keep track of whi- whiplash but i mean you your dream like we talked on the phone for years you're like man i just i just want to farm and i want to have bison and i just love these things and you, you were fascinated with learning how to 
raise them, care for them, process the meat, like make the process in kind of like, I don't want to use the word holistic because I think it's abused by people, yeah. <laughs> but in a, in a super holistic kind of manner, you know, and I like to call it reality. Yeah. Um, it's real, you know, it's real. And, and the bison aspect for me, you know, we've, we've always eaten wild game, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so wild game has always been a part of our diet and, and I, you know, haven't bought beef or any of that for years and years um and so i recognized like i've always loved bison but i had the opportunity to go help a friend who was managing a bison ranch and help him feed animals and when when i was in that moment and in that herd like that little smoldering flame that i had just ignited we're in a windstorm here, yeah. just for everybody. Uh, I don't know what's going on right now, but <laughs> we're at like 8,500 feet, and the wind decided to start just ripping, and it's blowing everything over. And so, sorry about the audio. Um, yeah. On that, it is, it is a bit windy. I don't know if I have any winds. I don't have any wind things. Yeah. Well. Um. So anyway, we, you know, that that just kind of lit the flame, and and I was probably t- at that point I was 20 years into conservation yeah. work as my employment yeah and and uh done a lot of volunteerism and a lot of conservation work and spent a, you know a good portion of my life in that and mm-hmm. and we've had a lot of long discussions because you know there's so much politics and conservation and and um i think both of us in that industry have done our best to bring the voice of kind of that public land diy hunter the person that doesn't have the money necessarily the financial resources for these high-end places and say hey you know we're that voice in these groups of that demographic of hunter like the everyday guy and that's one thing i love about you is you know some there's one particular group i can think of in in mind that you've worked for that i don't necessarily agree with with their with their viewpoints and i know that you haven't always necessarily agreed but you were you were that voice of me in the regular guy in in that organization maybe that you know wasn't being told or heard heard was probably probably the accurate piece yeah and yeah. and um yeah a lot of a lot of great friends and family yeah. that, I, that have come from that and and i have no regrets no and, and it was a, a great opportunity and a great place to be in life mm-hmm. um but you know at the end of the day like you can only travel so much and you can only work so long and do some so much that you know, you just need change. Yeah. You, you know, something that's good for your heart. Yeah. Every, you know, and, and there was a lot of stress involved. And like you said, the politics, I, you know, I get very emotional about that stuff. Yeah. So it would just wasn't, yeah, it was starting to burn a hole in my heart yeah. basically. And, uh, so the best thing for me to do was just take a break Exit. and that's, yeah. And that's what, and so to that point, you know, it's been four or five years in the making now for this bison operation, but you know, that point of feeding those animals lit that flame and I just went on a journey of learning everything about the animal like everything about the aspects of being a bison rancher because I have never been a rancher of any shape or form of well he does llama farm I do have llamas I had llamas he llama farms which was a really funny thing for me when you started buying llamas I was like you want to get spit on (laughs) like I mean this is a thing (laughs) okay (laughs) So yeah, so we got llamas for hunting, obviously, but uh, they're like, just get a donkey. They're they're lower maintenance than your damn mules. Ugh. They don't. They're, yeah, but if, you can't if they ride step a on me, if they step on me, I'm not broke down. If they kick me, it's, it's not going to send me to the hospital. Okay, I've never. My mules have never stepped on me, and I I don't recall a time where a mule has ever kicked me. Well, as everybody knows, you were a diamond. <laughs> and <laughs> just saying. So that's it, why. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to have. I mean, I'm not saying it has. I was 13. <laughs> I had a mule kick me. I take that back. It was kind of my fault. But she was also being kind of a bee. <laughs> <laughs> um, but kind of 50 I, I, I grew up on horses. I, yeah. you know. But I, they're not I, for everyone. I get it. Yeah. And I, and I just that, like to give you there, a hard time. There's Oh, and I, vice versa. There's a lot of aspects to it, right? Like there's a lot of nuances. Like if you have mules, you're feeding them, you know, at least through the winter. Um and I have to feed my llamas too, but they eat a anything. fraction. They eat anything, but they eat a fraction of the feed. Um, they don't, you don't, water's not a big issue kind of thing. There's just a lot of like, when I'm hunting, I want to be hunting. I don't want to be rodeoing. Yeah. You're cowboying. Yeah. Cowboying. So mm-hmm. it could be both with 
with horses and mules. So not everybody's had the great experience that you've had throughout the years. Like yeah. there's, I've heard of plenty of. Well, mine aren't saints. I mean, rodeos my mule Otis is like 17 hands and he's great. He's packed his whole life, but that sucker jumps water. And it's fine when he has packs on, he can jump all he wants. But when you're on him, <laughs> I'm not joking. You get straight up G-forces. It scares me to death. Like, my horse can jump a creek all day long, and I'm like, whoop-de-doo, he's 15 hands. He's not He's not like muskox strong or moose strong. Right. My mule, when he jumps, it is so hard, and he is so strong. Um, it, it's hard to even put into words. Like, like, my horse, I can jump a creek, and I'm like, ooh, you know, no big deal. But you put me on that mule, and he jumps, he scares me to death. <laughs> So, I mean, none of them are perfect, right. you know. I mean, it's not that he's trying to be mean. It's just there's like when an animal is 1,500 pounds, yep. there's so much power yep. there. And you're you're all along for the ride. Like, I've Nick got it on video. He jumped a creek one time, and I kind of flung back of my binoculars, black-eyed me. And he got it on camera, <laughs> and I have this photo of my binoculars, black-eyed me as Otis is jumping. So they aren't, have one of these. they aren't perfect. I get it. I get it. You know, and they all have their own little things that they do. Yep. Or don't no, do. they're yeah. none of them perfect. <clears throat> no. Absolutely not. But for me, and at the time when I got the llamas, like they're they're the right choice, and they're still gonna work out great. That said, like now we have acreage and grass and hay yeah. and stuff. And, and you have and to keep them separate from your bison. Lifetime, yeah, yeah, which is not a huge deal, but you know, life's different now. Like I didn't have the time before to like a lot of training because you know you have to keep up on your animal just like you you have yeah. to keep in shape your animals have to stay in shape like time's different now and, and i'm 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 looking for you know we're looking for horses and stuff or mules um and that'll come we'll get into that yeah i'll keep them i'll keep the llamas too because they have their place their in place. life yeah. yeah but uh but yeah i forgot where we we're going i have no idea story. it doesn't matter <laughs> we're just talking uh no but, so wild bison ranch <clears> no now you're you're your goal is ultimately you're gonna you have meat hunt uh, not meat hunts but meat animals, but eventually you might be able to offer meat hunts and trophy hunts yeah. someday. That's yep. kind of a goal. That's coming down the road. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. And what's cool about that, in my opinion, is people that want to have this experience where it's truly, um, I, I don't want to say it's fair chase because it's it's, just, it's more like um, self sufficiency, mm -hmm. learning self sufficiency. <laughs> Um, it's not, it's a different aspect than like going out deer, elk hunting, hunting bison, but it would be kind of, you know, for a lot of people to have that kind of pioneering American experience where you actually harvest process and take home similar to you would with wild game, but yep. in a different component. It's so yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, you're going to offer bison and something. No, it's not a hunt. It's not a hunt. But That's what I'm saying. If you want to harvest your own animal yeah. in our field. I'm, I'm cool with that. Like, yeah. we can arrange that. It's yeah. not something I, like, offer right now, whatever. Yeah. But if somebody wanted to do that and it was, like, you know, somebody new to this whole um, aspect of knowing where your food comes from. Yeah. And they wanted to come out and experience that, mm -hmm. I would I would absolutely entertain that and yeah. love, to, love to make that happen. It's not a hunt. No. Um, I am. And, I, you know, and everybody's got their own definitions of hunt, right? But, you know, talking about the future, like, I'll be able to – I'm – working on properties where I'll be able to turn, you know, some bulls loose on those properties and then we'll go out and yeah. hunt them. Yeah. And, and it'll be a hunt because those things are freaking wild. They're yeah. They're not, I mean, yeah. you know, and it all depends on how much human interaction and what kind of personality yeah. they have. But a lot of those old, like older age bulls, um, they, they're wily. They're not, you know, they're, yeah. they're just like anything else. They don't, they want to be left alone and you have a big enough chunk of land. If you go out and hunt yeah. them, you well, know. Well, think about it. Eastern Oregon has <clears throat> some wild bison that got <clears throat> loose, or bison that were not wild, but they, <laughs> they're they wild. And th those guys are like, man, th they are there one minute, and they are gone. Mm -hmm. And and I know a lot of people that spend a good amount of time looking for them, and they hide in plain sight, yep. and they, they're really uh, they're really cagey animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... Be. and fact of the matter is there's no fence that can hold them in no, no literally yeah. yeah so anyway like fencing them in's not not going to be a thing if you're like treating them like a wild animal yeah. so but anyway yeah, yeah. that's something that we want to offer and, and we're 
as we as we fix things up around the place because when we bought the place it was run down it was yeah. nobody lived in it in five years nobody really done anything in the last 10 so there's a lot of a lot of things that have to be brought up to speed like irrigation fencing the house the living conditions all that stuff um and you guys just went through that big yellowstone flood and just got wiped out I yeah felt so bad like you sent me photos and your because your property is river bottom and i could not believe the photos like yeah you're out there paddling in your boat where your wall tent camps were yeah so yeah so we have wall tents set up on the river to to rent out and like have, ecotourism, like Airbnb yeah. tent camping, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's Bridger Canvas yeah. Cabins, and it's on Airbnb, and, and they're furnished. they got beds. You know, it's, it, They call it glamping. I, I don't like calling it that, but that's kind of what it is. But there's beds and everything, and you can come stay, and there's just a ton to do around there. Yeah. But we had these tents on the river, and they're set on decks. And we built these decks, and they're sitting on that. And um, Yeah, when that flood hit, so we're on the Clark's Fork of the Yellowstone, and... We knew that thing. Knew we knew it was coming, and so we were going by their <coughs> predictions. Predictions, yeah. And I went down. I'm like, oh, this is actually quite a bit higher than it was last year. And like, I don't. The road going down to where the tents were is low, and then it comes back out. And so the river kind of fl- flooded into that already. I'm like, shit, I don't like. Even if we went out now to get them, we're gonna have problems getting through that section. And so I got on there and looked at their predictions. You know, got on their website and. They're like, yeah, it's supposed to peak at like 12 foot one. And at 12 foot one, nine foot was flood stage. It's supposed to peak at 12 foot one. Um, and at 12 foot one, we still had like almost two feet to spare. I'm like, well, it's got to come up two more feet above that. We're good. We came down. So that was at like nine o'clock in the morning. We went down at lunchtime and it had come up and was like, I thought it was higher than 12 one. And now it's too late. Like you, you're not yeah, pulling yeah, the yeah, tents yeah, out. Yeah. So we came back just before dark and the tents were floating on those decks. Like it had come up two feet in just a handful of hours. And we're like, oh, and decks were starting to float away. So we ran back to the house, grabbed a canoe. My brother and I came out and we canoed out in the river that was, you know, flood stage. I mean, we're talking, they said it's a 500 year flood. Yeah. And I believe it because the (coughs) debris and logs that were coming down that river was unbelievable. Yeah. So we're out there dodging logs in the canoe and tying stuff up. We took a bunch of rope up out and we're tying up decks. We're tying up the tents, we're like just tying them to brush and trees to keep everything from floating. Were away. you able to salvage most of that stuff doing it? We lost one section of deck. Um, it floated away. We didn't get it in time, but we saved everything else. Um, and it flooded and it put a bunch of mud inside the tents and stuff, but it didn't really damage anything outside of that. We got off pretty lucky there. But we had to tear everything down, clean everything up, and we have to reset everything. Mm-hmm. So, because they're sitting on decks and blocks, and all the blocks that they were sitting on floated away, so they're just kind of sitting on the ground. But yeah, we got hit a little bit, but nothing compared to a lot of people. Yeah. Like what a lot of people experienced. Yeah, a lot of people lost it. I mean, there was houses going down yeah, the river. There was crazy. houses, um, real estate. Like, w- there was like, um, I forget the number of bee boxes that floated down the river, but. The estimated loss was like eighty thousand dollars in bees. Oh my gosh! That they lost. That's a there's a I forget what they call them the bee place the honey keepers yeah yeah there's a term for it I don't know place that processes the honey yeah they they have all the bees bee boxes around there so are you gonna you know. do bees on your place yeah my brother is already yeah. you know it's a family operation so I'm managing the bison side of it and my brother and sister in law are doing chickens um, you know they're doing free uh, what do they call it? Um, they're in chicken tractors that are in the field and they move them around. I have I no idea called. what that means. Anyway, they got chickens. They got meat chickens. They got eggs and ducks. Uh, chi- you know, laying chickens and ducks. And then my brother's doing some bees. So I'm. I just want to focus on the bison. Mm-hmm. But and you guys are doing jerky sales, meat sales. Mm-hmm. People can go on on your website. Yep. Right now, which is what wildbison.com wildbisonranch.com okay yep. and they can order steaks jerky yep yeah so we have so we have a couple of different um opportunities to buy meat and so there's 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 four different levels of of meat processing in the u.s and the first one is and the, the highest level of meat processing and sales is usda certified mm-hmm. which is what 90 percent of people Beef. 
anything grocery stores. all of it yeah any any meat that's processed has to be usda inspected if you're going to sell it anywhere in the united states pretty much um and so that so that process is is you have to haul the animal to the processing facility alive well i'll back up that process is that there has to be a federal inspector like views the animal while it's still alive to make sure it's healthy and then the animal's killed in the presence of that inspector and then the animal is skinned and then put into a you know meat locker a cooler um that can happen one of two ways the you can there is a way to field harvest and then put it in a trailer and then haul it to the processing facility that process requires a uh, inspector on site you know mm-hmm. a federal agent on site um which is really expensive yeah i can imagine because any processing facility that you buy meat from they have one or the place that we get processed for our USDA side, they have two inspectors. They have one on the kill floor going into the cooler and then one from the cooler going into the packaging and cutting and packaging side of it. So they, they have to pay, f- they're basically paying their wage mm-hmm. and they have to provide them a office to work out of. So there's quite a bit of expense as a USDA certified um, processing plant to just to be legal yeah. to, to the USDA side. So right now we're not able to field harvest, so I have to load them in a trailer, haul them to the, you know, processing facility, and then they go through that, you know, kill them and process yeah. them and everything. I don't care for that too much because there's just something about me that doesn't like loading bison into a trailer and hauling them to a processing plant. Yeah. I just... You'd just rather have doesn't feel in the good field. in the soul, you know. Yeah. And but in order to play the game, that's what you have to do. Yeah. So we'll do that. I all the time I'm doing that. I'm working on that field harvest option. Yeah. Okay, I like that too. <clears throat> like for me personally, being a hunter, people say a lot of times, "Well, how how can you shoot a deer? How do you do? I mean, how can you kill an animal?" And it's like, man, they're out there eating grass, being deer. They're not afraid. They're just loving life. And you harvest that animal, and it's the most, like, humane thing as far as, you know, dying, in my opinion, for an animal can be is in their natural element, mm-hmm. doing and living their life. Like you said, putting them in a trailer and taking them. My kids, my sister's kids raise pigs for a fair. Yeah. And they put those pigs in, in the trailers. And and now they, they've got, you know... The pigs, they won't even take pigs that have any kind of injuries now or limps because, like, the pigs are dying in the trailers. Uh, that have Typically, they die if they have leg injuries. It stresses them out and they ended up dying. And then, you know, the, the pigs, yeah. you know, the, the transporter is responsible. That transportation process is, is rough on but animals. It's super stressful it's on super them. It's super stressful. And, and there are scientific studies that show the difference in, yeah. in the, the makeup of the meat. That's why I like being a hunter. Mm-hmm. You know, the way we harvest, um, I mean, it's just, it's a, I, I find it to be a beautiful part of life. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful process. Well, it's the part of reality that people, some people choose not to be a part yeah. of. But, but yeah, and, and yeah, and so there's definitely a difference in, in the meat, um, the stress level of the animal. Yeah. And so the, the other, the other, the second option which we utilize is called custom exempt. And so that's, what a lot of like your rural folks, like mm-hmm. if you bought, you know, say your neighbors got four cows and yeah. he's like, Hey, you want to buy some cow? And you're like, yeah, I do. And you're like, yeah, I'll buy it. I'll buy a quarter of it. Mm-hmm. And then, so he'll sell all four quarters. And then, then once you've, you have to give a down payment, he'll kill that animal, gut it, and then take it to the processor or he'll have the processor come out, kill it, gut it. They'll take it and process it. And then that meat will come right back to you and it says it'll be packaged and say not for retail sale or not for sale. Yeah. And it's yours only. You can't yeah. you can't turn around and sell that to anybody yeah. legally. A tool of history and a symbol of the old West. The Marlin Lever Action Rifle is the classic American long gun. Annie Oakley trusted the model 1891 above all others to demonstrate her legendary marksmanship and today her iconic shooting prowess can still be harnessed every time you pick up a Marlin lever action rifle. Marlin rifles now ride under the Ruger brand and with that 
you can expect the same time-honored features of the traditional Marlin rifle, hardened by Ruger's own special mark of exacting standards and legendary innovation. Ride for the brands that you are proud of, Ruger and Marlin. You get um, your portion of that animal. So they cut that animal up. And you'll have, you know, 20 ribeyes and, you know, yeah. 10 New Yorks and whatever and 300 pounds of grind. That will be split up evenly by four. And then you get that portion. Yeah. That's And we do that process, which I prefer because, number one, it's, you know, I mean, you're getting give, getting rid of more meat at, at one time. Um, but also I'm getting to, I'm able to field harvest. Yeah. Which is, I mean, and then personally, I like don't enjoy that part. Like, I don't like killing my animals. But it makes you feel but better about the death you're giving them. The, they're going to, you know, if it's going to happen, I want it to be by me. And I yeah. want it to be, in the, you know, in the field. And, and honestly, when we shoot them, um, like, I'll shoot it. You know, it'll fall. And I'll go right over there. And I have to chase the other animals away mm -hmm. to bleed it. So I'll slit its throat and bleed it out on the ground. And I, I like have to watch my back because when they protect one, it. Mm -hmm, when one dies, they surround them. Um, and so I like have to be careful in that piece. But uh, but I much prefer that for the animal and just for for myself, my own sake. That and it's just a better process. And then there's two other ways that you can buy meat that aren't Not really to relevant this conversation, to this yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I think people, you know. Even myself, you, when you go to the grocery store and you buy a package of meat, you don't really think about uh, what goes into it being there and, and what the animal goes through, you know, for that package to be there. And um, there's so much judgment that comes into being a hunter. And I think, you know, honestly, hunters uh, care for animals more than anybody else in the world. Mm -hmm. like, like, you know, the consideration that you put into what the animals you're raising are going through uh, to fulfill their purpose, which, you know, we, we, there's a, there's a circle of life here and it's a sustainable harvesting practice and, and you're managing these animals for that purpose. And, and, um, it's, you know, it's part of, part of life is also, you know, harvesting meat and growing vegetables. And like you said, you guys are doing the whole, what is the, it's not a hobby farm. You're, you're, you're a small scale commercial farmer now. Yeah. 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 It's. I mean, I, I don't know what number makes you legit, but I feel like we're we have there. we have forty two we have forty two animals right now, um, so we have nine yearling bulls, two breeder bulls, and the rest are breeding cows. Mm -hmm. um, and then we just I I don't know what the number is right now. I think we're at like twenty six calves, um, twenty seven maybe. So we just had a bunch of calves, which is awesome, really like, fun, really fun piece. Like so for all your listeners. Uh, bison calves are called red dogs. Nuh uh. Yeah, because they look like little red dogs. Aww. They're cuter than shit. Um, yeah, and is what's funny is that we call it the zoomies. They'll get the zoomies. And they do. And they're just running around. Yeah. And you know when a dog gets to run and the <laughs> mm -hmm. dog gets the zoomies, like it, it's like its ass is trying to pass its front legs. Yeah. They do that. It's hilarious. They just run around. So they're cute. Um, then they have a great life. Yeah, they have a great life. Like they're all happy. Um, and we try to keep them happy because. You know, the big misnomer about bison is, oh, they tear up fences. And which is true. Bison will tear up a fence if they're not happy. Yeah. If, they're, if you're not providing food and water for them, they will go somewhere else. And yeah. there's not many fences that that'll can hold them. hold them in. I mean, it's you don't have the money to build that fence. No. So if you just keep them happy and um, we're, we're right now, we're cell grazing. And so we're doing what they call regenerative ranching. And it's taken, it's, it's not your typical ranching practice of just turn them out, you know, turn them out in the summer and then bring them in in the winter and mm -hmm. feed them hay. Like we're, don't do that. Um, we're cell grazing, which it's called the herd effect. And so if you put them in a smaller area, so right now our cells are about seven acres, you put them in a smaller area so that they focus on that area. They eat all the grass relatively evenly. Um, and what, and there's like weeds and stuff like we got thistles and we have a uh, foxtail. It's also called squirrel tail and um, some other weeds. They'll actually, they won't necessarily eat the weeds. Some still eat some of the thistle and stuff, but they'll stomp it into the ground. And so they actually kill the weed while they're there. Very interesting. Yeah. And so, <coughs> and then, and then what they don't eat, 
they're also like the grass that they don't eat they're also stomping into the ground which is beneficial because it's returning that organic matter back into the soil mm. which is a positive thing so they're helping helping kill the weeds they're eating the grass down and then they're you know they're helping return some of that back into the soil then we'll move them after whatever you know every cell's different so it might be five might be seven days we'll move into the next one they won't be back to that cell for right now i think our rotation is pushing 70 days mm -hmm. so we'll just move them cell to cell to cell and we got this rotation dialed in that's we balance out our irrigating with that because we're flood irrigated and mm -hmm. so we got to like time all this and it's, there's some logistical issues there but it's fascinating it, actually yeah but it's not it 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 is a it's, it's just it's kind of a some people think oh that's a lot of work i'm like well so is like moving them like a lot of the, our neighbors who rent you know have cows like they're trucking their cows all over the place all su all summer for feeding long. yeah mm -hmm. they're moving them in trailers and trucks all the time and then they have like hundreds of acres where they've planted corn to feed them for the winter. Yeah. And my mindset's different. I'm like, well, why wouldn't you just plant grass there and rotational graze them? It's going to benefit the soil. It's going to benefit the grass and you'll be able to grow more grass. Mm -hmm. And, and then you won't have to feed in the winter if you do your rotations correctly. So two and different you, mindsets. Because you're not overgrazing. Right. And so overgrazing means that, so the principle is the rest time, and, and I'm by no means an expert on this. I've just I've spent the last four years educating myself on it, and so now we're actually putting it into practice. But the, the, the benefit is in the rest period for the grass. So overgrazing is if you just turn them out on this, you know, 70 or 100 acres, how many head you have, and you have 100 acres, and you just turn them out and you let them do their thing, they're going to wander all over that thing. And they're going to eat here. They're going to eat there. You're going to have highs and low spots. Mm -hmm. And you're going to eat there. And, and then over here, they haven't touched in four or five days. And the grass has started to green up again. And so it's getting four or five inches tall. They're going to go back over there and they're going to eat that grass. Because it's sweet. It's tender shoots. It's what they want. And so when they do that, then they just eat it lower and lower and lower to the ground. And then pretty soon, that grass is not going to want to grow back. Because I think it's after two bites, they call it. Um, after they've eaten off that green shoot twice, that grass, it stops its growth for the year. Mm. So that's where your overgrazing comes in. We just let them do, do their thing. Because you're going to have high spots because it's not mm -hmm. a sweet. And they're yep. not going to want those spots. Yep. They want those. They want that low baby grass. So they keep hitting that fresh grass. <laughs> when you sell graze, it forces them to eat the high stuff. Yep. Like it forces them to eat what's there. Um, when we're able to do that with um, just two wire poly. Like we wow. In, in, as our divider fences yeah. and it's not by any means bulletproof because when they want to when they're ready to move they move themselves like yeah. they'll they'll remove that poly wire yeah um which is fine like it's you know not that big a deal it's that perimeter fence i don't mm -hmm. want them breaching but um and we were on five wire high tensile yeah hot fence but uh but so we'll move them around like that and and i already had my first opportunity to hammer weeds so we 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 moved them this spring out of, we had a, like a winter lot. And then I actually fed like 15 bales. I didn't feed a bale all spring and then, or all winter, sorry. And then in the spring, as the grass was starting to green up, I wanted to keep them off of it as long as possible. Yeah. So we had this, um, I think it's probably like seven or eight acres that we kept them in most of the winter after they, they fed off all the tall grass. And as spring hit, they were about done with all the grass that was in there. Cause I let it grow all summer. I didn't, yeah. I didn't graze anything on in the summer. So the grass was super tall. They ate that through the winter. And then, like I said, we were trying to get that grass grow up. So I fed 15 bales. So I fed like two bales a day, bale a day, two bales a day, depending on what the weather's like. And I did that for like three or four weeks. Were you talking about a thousand pound bales? Mm -hmm. Help, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Big round bales. Yeah. <coughs> um, and so that gave the, gr the green grass a chance to grow up. Yeah. And so we moved them into the first paddock and they fed through that and then we rotated them around and then we've got a north field and a south field. And so we moved them out of that north field because they'd made the full rotation, yeah. moved them into the south field. Well, while they're in that south field in the first rotation, which I think we have six or seven paddocks in that south field, the very first one that they grazed in the spring, it was getting tall. Like it was, you know, already growing up pretty good, but it had a whole bunch of foxtail and foxtail's 
bad. I, I hate it. Yeah. Like, it's horrible. Um, and so I'm like, man, what am I going to do? Like, we're not spraying, you know, we're not doing this, you know, so what do we do? And so I went back to the regenerative side of things. We actually we took a mower, a brush hog, and I brush hog the dense patches of, of the, it's actually called squirrel tail, this species. I brush hogged as much of that as I could. And then, then I brought them back in and I left them in there like for an extended period of time. So like they should have probably been in there for like. You brush hogged it. You didn't remove it. You let, let it lay. Yep. I brush hogged it just as it was starting to, you, just as you could tell, you know, it starts to flower out a little bit or seed out. It's not seeded yet, but just as you can tell, it's going to be a foxtail because it's hard to tell the difference in those grasses. Um, so once it starts to seed out, went in there and brush hogged it, and there were still some in there. Then I brought them in, which was probably, you know, 30 or 40 days before I should have brought them in there to let the grass grow up. Yeah. But I wanted to kill out that foxtail. So I brought them in there and just ate it to the ground. And then now I've, just before we actually came to attack, I moved them over back back over to the original rotation um so th- in theory they ate that grass down low because i kept them in there probably three or four days longer than they should have normally because i want that grass to be eaten down i want to stun its growth i i don't want that to grow back and seed out yeah for the next year because it's an annual so if it seeds out it's just going to keep seeding yeah. every single year so if i can hammer it before it seed stage it'll kill it so that's our goal. We'll find out next year how well that worked, but um, it looks great right now. The noxious weed thing is a huge issue. So, like, on my small 60 acres in Oregon, it was never-ending. Thistles yeah. were yeah. horrible. Like, I have had, I had that property for five years, and, and last year, the year before, I had, like, a hundred thistles come out of nowhere. Yeah. Anywhere we disturb the soil, all of a sudden it thistles. And Yogi and I were out there with shovels, shoveling and burning thistle. Yep. Um, and and then this year we didn't have thistle. I actually have. So most people call it tennis elbow. I call it I call it thistle killing elbow. Yeah. From stabbing thistle with a shovel. I'm telling you that yeah. stuff. It's and it's doesn't. It's not there every year. <laughs> no. And so, uh, to really geek out and go dig deep into that. Weeds are there for a reason, and the reason is usually soil-related. It has something to do with the soil. Mm-hmm. And so thistles pop up, and, and thistles are actually nature's way of repairing soil. Mm. So after you disturb the ground, thistles are the first thing to come up yep. because it's repairing. Yep. It makes perfect sense. Yep. And so I like at first I was like, oh, we need to get rid of all this thistle. And then I did a bunch of research, and a good, a good friend of mine who I actually bought the bison from has taken, um, he's actually fixing to be certified for, you know, soil and ranch management, the regenerative Mm -hmm. methods. And he sent me a a little screenshot of his book and it talks about weeds and why weeds are there. And it's always soil related. Mm -hmm. So if you've got thistle, that means there's something in your soil that's out of balance Mm -hmm. or you've disturbed it. Or something. That was the case for me. It was a mm-hmm. disturbance. Yep. And, and then cheatgrass also really likes to come in during ground disturbance mm-hmm. is the other thing, um, which. Another, know, another really horrible, bad one. Horrible really bad to one. get rid another of. Well, because the animals don't even want to eat nope. it. No. Another one you can, and you can kind of control if you get in there and, and, you know, get it on the ground before it seeds. Yeah. However that is, if you mow My it thing, or whatever. I, I sprayed for cheatgrass with chemicals. The problem is you can't kill a broadleaf weed and cheat grass without killing. Like I had sandfoin planted, um, which is a legume um, similar to alfalfa. Uh, alfalfa and, and sandfoin are, are somewhat similar in protein levels and whatnot. Um, palatability, sandfoin's a little higher, but it won't. You can't get as many cuttings out of it. Um, but if I wanted to spray cheat grass i could spray cheat cheat grass and not kill my sand point but if i wanted to spray for the cheat grass and the broadleaf weeds nothing's gonna grow yep so you have to have this balance of you know what am i gonna put in there the the one thing i was learning was if i sprayed my cheat grass and you water good enough and the grass gets the opportunity to flourish like if you seed in the fall 
and you you do it right you know you sow your you sow your seed in properly and you get it enough water the broadleaf weeds have a hard time competing with grass mm -hmm. it's drought when the dra when the grass gets choked back with drought that the weeds are like ha ha yeah. <laughs> i don't need as much as you do so I'm going to take over. And so that was the problem I had is I didn't have irrigation. I had, I had domestic water. I was watering my food plot off of. And, you know, my frequency um, could have been better on the watering. Um, and that would have helped kind of choke out those broadleaf weeds. But when you don't have flood irrigation capabilities, it's a lot harder yeah. to control that broadleaf yep. weed growth, um, which I'll geek out on the farming with you. So it's fine. Yeah, I we'll love go it. right there. Well, well so my <laughs> epiphany with this is that I think I have a bug down my shirt, so excuse you, me. You it's get really it? I, I literally had oh. this is it flew down there. I would have got that for you. That's no freaking Kay. gross. <laughs> Usually the front of my shirt catches food. <laughs> uh <laughs> this is the first time I've caught a bug. Food trap. I don't think that's Whatever the first time happened. There's probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. That was highly distracting and I the audio listeners would never have known, but if I didn't call it out, the video video watchers would have been like, What is she doing? Anyway, sorry. Don't be. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you podcast with me. So Yogi and I are looking at 255 acres, and that has been a pasture for cattle. And I'm looking at this thing, like, so overwhelmed. Like, number one, I have, you know, four animals, three mules and a horse. And there's, you know, three of them are fat, like, roly poly blah, 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 blah. One of them starving to death. And I'm like, how do I manage this thing? And, I, and I'm overwhelmed with fencing and just listening to you talk about, hey, you can do these smaller pastures and it doesn't take as much to hold them in. And I'm like, ha, huh, maybe, maybe this is a more feasible way that I could manage that large space. But then also you and I talked about like, if I get it, maybe you could bring bison in and rotate some bison out there. Um, I mean, I, 255 acres, what do you do with it? It's all grass. Yeah. Like you there's. You, I mean, you can let it grow a little bit, but then it's not good for it to just leave it alone. Well, right? it's been and sitting and for you years, yeah. And you don't have enough animals to, to, to do, do anything, anything with it. With well, it, what so. am I? I'm going to let them eat yeah. to death. I mean, yeah. I can't do that, right. you know. So you got to. Is it irrigated? No, it's no. all natural. All natural. Um, That's but good. there's That's two reservoirs on it, uh, natural reservoirs that I think I could line and really, you know, get some Maybe water. pump in. some water yeah. out. But yeah. yeah. But I wanted, I wanted to touch on the soil thing before we got too far ahead because. It kind of was an epiphany for me, and it, it kind of turned my mindset around. Is because you know you you see the the weeds is the problem, um, but the weeds aren't a problem; they're the symptom. Mm -hmm. Like they're the they're the, you know um, they're an issue to the problem. The problem is actually the soil and what's going on with the soil. And so I was read a little deeper into it, and and it's just imbalances in the soil that cause the weeds. Yeah, and. So uh, by addressing what those imbalances are in the soil. And you can do a soil test. They do a, mm, what's it called, like a yep. pH test on your soil. Yeah. yeah, there's, I mean, it's like multi-level. There's a lot of different things they look at in the soil. But you figure out what, what your soil is lacking or what it has too much of. And then you try to figure out how to balance that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the weeds go away. So that's without chemicals, without chemicals. Exactly. Yeah, with yeah. your management practices. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to say that, you know, maybe some, some man-made fertilizer isn't going to happen because like our place, half of it's been farmed its whole life. Yeah. And so that soil, soil actually does get addicted to fertilizer because it's just, that's what it's always had. Yeah. And so it takes time and you kind of have to transition it into the, you know, regenerative side of life. Um, and the funny thing about soil is, is like soil's a living organism. Like yeah. people don't think of it that way, but soil's a living organism. Like it, it is full of all kinds of living things. Absolutely. And I'm not the scientist and I'm not the Well, and when you dig a expert, potato for the first time out of the ground and you touch a potato and it's warm, it's like for me, that was the first epiphany of this is Mother Earth. This, this soil is the incubation of sustainability mm -hmm. as far as harvesting food and um she is this ground is the mother mm -hmm. um it's the same as a womb it's warm it, it's nurturing it's giving and you have to put into that womb what you're trying to get out you know if you want the healthiest yield on your harvest you have to put into that ground what's going to help it yield you know just like when you're pregnant not that i've ever been pregnant you want to <laughs> eat well so you have a healthy baby it's the same thing right have you ever tried no. Oh. 
<clears throat> to get pregnant? I no, I no, yeah, no. I'm no. my husband and I were married, but we don't. You do don't that. try to get we pregnant. Don't do that, no. Okay, Jeez. I just wondered. No. Um, yeah, so clearly it's, we're married. It's we don't do that. He's <laughs> 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 just your arm charm. Yeah. <laughs> no. So 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 there's microorganisms and fungus in the soil that make it alive, and that's what makes it grow. Thing. Like yeah. that's what things grow in is yeah. that that live soil. And uh, I mean, we this freaking rabbit hole is huge. I don't want to go down it because I'm not the expert, but I do know that there's a huge difference in in a field that's been tilled all its life mm -hmm. and a field that has just been you know farmed and used for grazing and um hasn't been a bunch of chemicals and fertilizers and yeah. stuff on it um which one of our fields has always been farmed it's always been tilled like it's had the shit tilled out of it so we're trying to bring that one that's the exciting part of what we're doing right now is like we're going to turn that back into grazing but we had to plant a whole bunch of um legumes and we planted a bunch of annuals but like radishes mm -hmm. and peas and um We've got alfalfa and clover and like a bunch of different grasses. But the goal is, is those annuals, like the radish and that sort of thing, like they're going to grow up, their roots are deep, mm -hmm. so they're going to penetrate the soil. Tubular roots. Mm -hmm. And then when they die, they're going to go back into the ground and create organic matter, mm -hmm. which helps feed the organisms and, and yeah. everything that makes soil alive. Um, when you till, you kill that. You literally yeah. kill that, that mother, what mother nature created. Yeah to grow things and so excited about that piece because you know you read about it and you hear about it and you listen to podcasts about it yeah. and now we get to put it in actual practice hey you guys i'm christy titus and we're out here hunting using on x hunt to help locate access points and roads to take our side by side the goal is to find those spots where we can get farther away from pickup traffic stay on approved roadway systems cover more miles, do more glassing, and have a better opportunity at finding the animal of a lifetime. You guys, if you're not using Onyx to help you locate approved roads, you should start today. And if you're new to Onyx, use code WILD20 at checkout for your elite membership to save 20%, code WILD20. No-till farming. No-till farming podcast. But you're returning it from, you're not doing no-till farming, yeah. you're, you're gonna do grazing. Yeah, we're, we're turning it over from from farming to grazing but um but yeah it's just it's gonna be fun it's a blast it's um but yeah people don't you know people so there's a difference between soil and dirt and if you till it it becomes dirt yeah. and if you let it live and help it help it flourish it, it's soil which what is what produces right mm -hmm. so it's funny because our um and i maybe i'd love to follow this in a year but um all my neighbors are cattle guys they were blown away by the winter, and the bison don't hardly eat anything. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I didn't have to feed any hay. Um, and they just don't eat much because they're, they're wildlife. They're mm -hmm. just like, they're, we have not browsers. Well, we haven't domesticated them to the point where they rely on us for their food. Mm -hmm. They're still wild, just like elk, deer, you know, everything. Um, so their systems are, are designed to withstand the winters. Yeah. And of all the North American animals, like they're the best, best capable of withstanding like Montana and, you know, hard, hard, yeah. snowy winters. And so. Well, are, is this their native, like you're talking mm -hmm. about all the benefit that them grazing has into the ecosystem and the soil composition and plant life. I mean, is this their native ground anyway? I mean, weren't yeah. they here for that purpose yeah. at one point? Like God put them here. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey, let's have these animals here because they're good for the soil and they're yeah. great to eat before they're federal great government to eat. they're great to eat <laughs> yeah our before our federal government tried to uh exodus yeah yeah they were here <laughs> yeah but which is a cool story i do want to add this um and we don't have to talk about bison the whole time but um the cool story about our animals are they came from canada and they came from elk island national park the vast majority and we got like four or five that that did not come from elk island but the vast majority of our breeding herd right now came from Elk Island National Park. Those animals at Elk Island National Park in Alberta are direct descendants of um, Montana bison out of the Flathead Valley. And if any of your listeners are also Stephen Rinella uh, followers, Steve wrote a book called The American Buffalo. And there's a story in there, so you have to get the book and read it, but there's a story in there that uh, a, a Flathead Indian 
was married in in a tribe on the flathead you know which is the west side of the the mountains there up by Kalispell country um he left the tribe went over to the east side of the divide joined another tribe got married to another woman and then decided ah, i kind of want to go back to my other tribe but i know they're gonna be mad at me so and i'm probably gonna butcher this story but you get the gist you gonna be mad at me so one of uh i'm gonna bring him something yeah, I'm going to bring him something. <laughs> so one of the elders in the tr- in the new tribe said, hey, why don't you take him some bison calves, S- which still existed in some areas, right? They hadn't killed them all yet kind of deal. So he took six bison calves back. And when he got back, the the his old tribe, the Flathead tribe, didn't, didn't want the calves, didn't want him in the tribe. So he took those six calves down, sold them to two native ranchers, and then took the money and went to Missoula. And then... Um, I'm not going to tell you what happened there because you got to read the story. But he he essentially, in that move, helped save bison in North America because those two, it's um, Pablo and Allard, were the native ranchers. They grew those six calves to 600 bison. Wow. And then the federal government came in and said, hey, we're settling the Flathead Valley. We want you to, you got to remove all these bison. You got to get them out of here. And they're like, what do we do with 600 bison? And the federal government's like, we don't care. We don't want them. So they ended up selling some of them to some ranchers in Texas. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure some went back east um, to, you know, like a small handful. The vast majority of them ended up going north to Alberta. And that's when they got distributed to, like, Elk Island National mm-hmm. Park and the National Grasslands there. These animals are from that. So there's direct descendants. This is cool that's a really cool full conservation circle. piece, right? And I'm really into conservation. So for me to have that opportunity the way things transpired to bring just, these animals back right and it's super awesome mm-hmm. and and so i'm really going to um focus on those genetics and, and expanding those genetics mm-hmm. um and just trying to be a part of that conservation story um but it's just kind of a cool piece but you got to read that book it's a great book about bison if you're interested in bison at all um well there's such an iconic piece of american history that's a absolutely tragic yeah. tale i yeah. mean it's it's tragic, you know, what, what once was. Well, I mean, I can't imagine. I, we were through Yellowstone the other day and before the roads washed out. And, you know, we got to see the wild bison in Yellowstone. And that was really cool. And being a Wyoming resident. Um, you love saying that, don't you? <laughs> you rub it in a little bit more, okay? <laughs> uh, don't move to Wyoming. It's windy. <laughs> uh, being a Wyoming resident, you know, just driving through and, you know, having these animals is, is literally their wildlife still in Wyoming. And that is, um, that's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, there's not, there's not very many places in the world where you're like, yeah, this is a genuine wild animal here where, where we call home. And, um you know, that state's kind of one of the last frontiers and, um, driving your car and you see bison, don't get out of your car cause they'll kill you. I mean, can. For your listeners, um, if you're in Yellowstone National Park or any other park that has bison, like South Dakota, if their tail's up, you should probably get the hell out of the way. Tail That's, up is bad. Tail up is bad. Yep. If their tail's up and they ain't pooping, they want to kill you. Yeah. Yep. That's yeah. a telltale sign. Yeah, pun, I don't, pun intended. I don't mess around with the bison. When we were there, I'm like, I'm not getting out of the car. I'll take a picture or zoom in on the camera. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not. And they won't look at you. They'll they'll look from the side. And if they're looking from the side, that's also also a bad sign. A bad sign. Some yeah. of these were like laying down. Yeah. You know, that's they're, yeah. that's they're pretty relaxed at that point. I feel like. But uh, I'm sure they can move about like a grizzly bear and be on top of you and have so, a minute. So side story, Josh drew that tag. So there's a tag here. I don't want to talk about the tag. Never mind. We were in the we were in the park. Um, we were we were coming out of the wilderness yeah. in Montana down in the park. But anyway, um, we're looking for big bull bison, and we just happened to come into the park as we're hiking out. And, you know, you see bison, they're all big, right? You don't, like, what's a big bull bison? Yeah. I, I didn't know. And so you drive through the park, and you see all these bison. You see big bulls and everything. Well, we were way up high on top of the ridges above where most of the bison are, like the Lamar Valley. Yeah. And so we were up on these ridges, and there was some bulls up there that were by themselves. And there was one in particular that was out in the middle of this meadow. And I'm like, what, you know, we're glassing him from, like, 200 yards away. And I, I can't see his horns, you know, so we're trying to get it closer to get a bigger, better angle. And we got within like 100 yards, maybe 120 yards. We're glassing this thing. And I'm like, I, 
I cannot see his horns from 120 yards away through my 10 power binoculars. What the hell? So we start yelling at him, and we're like trying to get him to stand up, which he probably shouldn't have been doing. But we wanted to see him. And so he started like rolling, and uh, he was, we thought, I thought he was just wallowing. Well, what he was trying to do was get up because he was so freaking big. He couldn't get up. That it took a couple of rolls to get momentum to get his ass up off the ground. And when he turned around and stood at us and looked at us, I could just see the tips of his horns that were like his head was this wide and his horns were like this big. And so for your listeners, like if you can see a lot of horns, that's a good bull or whatever. But if you can't see horns, that thing is enormous. Like they, gr- their head grows into their horns basically. Right. So and if they have big horns that are obvious, they're smaller bulls. Yep, younger, smaller bulls. If you can't see horns, that is a giant bull. And that's, I mean, it's still to this day, that's the biggest bull I've ever seen. It haunts you a little bit. And, it was, and we were out in the middle of like 120 yards from this thing, standing out in the middle of a meadow. And I'm like, and he, we got him out of his bed. And this is not a smart place to be. <laughs> I'm like, with packs on, you know. I'm like, let's get out of Dodge. But anyway, it was kind of cool. Cool experience yeah. out there. And, and like legitimately... Like that thing could have killed us. Oh, you know, easy day. Yep. Yeah, it's nature's very humbling on their sheer power that some of these animals have, and mm-hmm. you know, they're, they, you know, they seem rather docile, but um, in reality, they're, they, they can be. I mean, they in Yellowstone, people get out and they, they attack people and kill people every year. It's like this is a wild animal. This is not a zoo. You're not. I mean, even in zoos, they're wild animals. But you know what I mean? Like yep. this is, this is na- like there's no fence here. There's nothing to protect you. Nope. Other than your own common sense, and hopefully some people have Most that. Most people don't have a that. A lot of people don't. Yeah. But, um, no, the bison thing is, sorry about this motorcycle here is going on there. You know how guys are? they got to uh, rev their engines. Like, like you got to rev my engine and be cool. <sighs> it's a thing. Whatever. I it's don't do thing. that. I don't do it. I don't know. It's like when you, what, are you, what is the rolling coal? Y- yes. Rolling coal on people, you yes. know, with the diesel trucks roll coal. Anyway, that's what's happening. Is that bad? It's stupid. Oh, okay. Don't do it in your oh, excursion. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I saw you rolling coal. Uh, so, no, I think what you're doing out there is awesome. I mean, you've taken this huge transition from, you know, focusing so much on, on working for other people to conserve to now you're doing your own conservation project in your own, literally in your own backyard, which is, uh, I love it. I think it's a great story and... I think it's super awesome, and and I love that you had this dream, and you know you talked about it for a few years, but your entire family did what it takes, and that's that's what I think you know you take a successful person from somebody who never achieves their dreams, and you have to just be willing to go for it. You know, if you have a dream and you don't make that step to make it happen, it's never happening, and and you found a way to make it happen, and and that's that's what it takes well it's like you said or you know we started this podcast that everything happens for a reason yeah. right and uh it, it was definitely my dream definitely my my project um but it would not have happened if i didn't have i mean it wouldn't happen to the rate it did i mean i would have found a way yeah but um my my stepdad mark who's since passed um he he w- he like was all in and yeah. that and that in him being all in on my dream um is a big part of the reason that we're here today. Mm-hmm. Um, and my mom and my, my brother, Todd, and sister-in-law, Shelly, and my wife, Jeannie. Like, we wouldn't, I wouldn't be pursuing yeah. that at the rate and, and degree that Your we are now. Your whole family is sacrificed. Yep, we You're all sacrificed. In, you've been in a season of sacrifice. Yeah. yeah, so to put it into perspective about, you know, what sacrifice looks like, we lived on, we had five acres uh, all fenced, irrigated, a beautiful lodge style home. Yeah. Um, in I was at your house. Florence, it Montana. Yeah. It was a beautiful place. Like we sold that. I talked my wife into selling that and paying off all our debt and putting money in savings and living in a one room apartment, one bedroom apartment for a year. And then, and then my parents decided to jump in. So they, we sold their place too. When we moved to this place that we have now, it's just south of Bridger. Um, which is south of Billings, Montana. When we bought this place, there was no livable, there was no house to live yeah. in. There was a house there. It wasn't livable, really. We all, my mom had a fifth wheel. So that my stepdad and mom were living in a fifth wheel. My wife and I lived in a she shed. Mm-hmm. It was a box that wasn't, it was as about half as big as this tent. 
no running water. The power was an extension cord, and we slept on cots. Yeah. We slept on cots and lived that life for four months. Mm -hmm. It was uh, we, sh we used an outhouse, uh, showered about once a week. Uh, the the big splurge was driving to town and getting a trucker shower at the old Flying J, and uh, like we lived that way for four months. Yeah. And it wasn't until I realized that we weren't gonna be l so we're renovating the top of the barn when I realized we weren't gonna be have that done and livable before winter hit. And finally, we broke down and bought a fifth wheel. Yeah. But we've been living in a fifth wheel, and um, which is great. I mean, it's fine. But, you know, the level of sacrifice from the beautiful house that we lived in to what's going on today is like, it was a freaking sacrifice. And, you know, it was daylight till dark. It still is. Work. You know, working daylight till dark. Um, which I, I asked for this, you know. I, yeah. And when times get hard, I'm like, I just got to remind myself, you asked for this. This yeah. is what you wanted. Yeah. Just suck it up, Buttercup. Um, well, and I think that um, things have become so easy, and, and I I have friends that are, you know, oh, I can't afford this or that, and they're driving brand new trucks. They yeah. they want a half million dollar house, and in you know I in my place in Oregon, I mean, I had a brand new custom home. It's like a, out of a book of magazine, beautiful homes, mm -hmm. and my husband and I have done the same thing. We're like we're selling that. We bought the cheapest house we could find that's 120 years old. Yeah. We will be 100% debt free. I wanted to not, I, I told my husband when we made our move, you know, obviously we're sacrificing not to the same degree, but I said, let's live simpler and let's live the lifestyle that we are going to have the most out of as far as life as a married couple. Like the house was great in Oregon. It's beautiful, almost 4,000 square foot, brand new custom home. I know, right? It's beautiful. I, rem I remember the house before that. Yeah, I know. Well, we won't talk about that story. <laughs> but it, I mean, it's a beautiful home. But I'm like, no, let's just let's let's get rid of all of this stuff. We bought a 120 year old house. We're living in downtown Sheridan, which yeah. is, is beautiful. It's a great right. neighborhood, cute house, but adorable house. But it's going backwards from what? Well, it's you know, not living going in the, backwards, Well, though. from living in the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From living in town, the country. Moving, like, yeah, you exactly. You feel like that's going yeah, backwards. Yeah, it is going backwards as far as that goes. You know, we don't have the things that I had gotten used to of having my mules in my backyard yeah. and my dogs. And, you know, my dogs got really used to for an hour a day, half hour in the morning, half hour at night. We're feeding mules. We're, we're touring the property, checking our quote unquote trap line. I don't have any of that stuff anymore, but uh, the way we looked at it is this our, this is our way to some financial freedom. We can pay cash for our house and we can buy property that, you know, we could never have in Oregon. But beyond that, property aspect of it is we have hunting and fishing and freedom and there's there's so much more to be said for that and our cars are paid for you know um and there's not I don't know a lot of people and I have a nice truck don't get me wrong I have a nice truck but I had a lot of equity going into my truck because I bought and sold vehicles well um our cars are paid for my drive my husband drives a old Toyota pickup truck but I mean, we've just, we've gone back from, you know, I have all these friends that have brand new cars, fancy RVs, huge mortgages, and they're always broke. And we're just like, no, what is your, what is in your heart really? Yeah. Where do you want to be in life? If things get crazy, like we saw with COVID, the most peaceful thing I had was my property. Like knowing that, you know, if they shut down town and, and everything is shut down, my husband and I can you know, still hike and breathe fresh air and have the freedom to move around and do the things we love um, because we had my, my property. And, and, and I feel horrible for kids that are, you know, at that time stuck in apartments and stuff. But we just decided it was better to live simpler, like you're talking about, emotionally, mentally, from a stress standpoint. Um, I don't need a big fancy house. Oh, oh shit. shikies. About lost that one. Yeah, the wind is really picking up. We're about to lose the whole... <laughs> about to lose the tent. The whole deal. We good? What if she... Yeah, something on it. Uh, yeah. There's these here. You know, so we, de yeah. we decided, like you're doing, not to the sacrifice that you and Jeannie are making and your family's making... We haven't had to sacrifice that much, but I think that a lot of people 
will find a lot more happiness in less is so much more. Yep. Less is so much more. When you don't have to worry uh, about your car payment and your mortgage payment, you're not drowning in all this debt and all this stuff, and you have the ability to go out and enjoy your life with less stress and, and to see more beautiful places, I think there's a lot to be said for that. Oh, 100%. Like, I commend you guys 100%. Like, the sacrifice yeah. you guys are still making. Yeah. yeah. You know. And, and we're not out of the weeds yet. You know, we're... I mean, we're I mean, literally a year into, you know, this business, basically, and, and um, you know, we're selling meat and stuff, but, you know, we're not, we haven't reached the point of financial stability no. yet and making ends meet. Like, I'm, the sacrifices are still, like... Huge. Yeah. I mean, we don't go out to dinner because no. we can't afford to. The beans you know. and rice diet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and we, don't get me wrong, we eat really well. Yeah. Like, we eat bison. <laughs> like, yeah. And I've still got a freezer full of elk meat yeah. and that sort of thing, but, but, like, you know, we don't, I about died. I didn't bring any food with me. I had to eat freaking buy a three street tacos in here and a yogurt and a Powerade. And it was $30. It's so, well, it was, up here is so expensive. But anywhere you go, like we, we couldn't go out and go, my wife and I couldn't go out to eat and not spend less than 40 bucks. No, you no, can't. No matter where you eat. No. Even hardly McDonald's anymore. No. So we just don't go out to eat. I don't, I, you know, I've dropped a lot of vices. I don't drink beer anymore. Um, oh, you've lost a ton of weight. Yeah, well, thank you very much. You look great. Thank you. I, uh, yeah, I mean, and a lot of that's ranch work, right? Like yeah. you quit drinking. I, I, I used to be, I mean, I used to drink, um, and I recommend anybody that is thinking about stopping, stop, cause you'll feel better for it. Yeah. And you'll live longer. Oh, I, I lost probably 15 pounds of beer fat in like four or five weeks. Yeah. I mean, it just melted off. Yeah. And I felt better. My mind worked better. Um, so Energy. yeah, I mean, but you know, part of that was part of that was I needed to because I was drinking a lot. But the other part is financially that mm -hmm. it didn't make any sense. Um, you just be surprised what you can live by. And what we were talking about earlier, I think, before we hit record was, you know, I don't know, we're talking about a TV show or something. Yeah. And, we're, and it's like, who has time to watch that? TV. I have no time to watch. Well, TV. there's more millionaires out there. I, I'm just studying people that have wealth and how they live, and they. You know, they don't watch TV at all, mm -hmm. you know, and I make a TV show, you know, I, I like say that, but you know, people that have wealth don't sit around and watch TV. Yeah. They're working. There's stuff to do. There's stuff to yeah. do. There's there, always there's stuff, stuff to, do. to do. And my husband and I, we don't, heck, what's his it. name? <laughs> Yogi. 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 But we don't even get in the house until seven thirty, eight o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially in the summer, because I, I have the mules, and I, I for me, that that's my, I don't have property right now. We live in downtown, so I have a little garden in town that I will, will dig flowers or whatever. But we go out, and we, we feed the mules at night, and I spray them for flies and clean their feet and jack around with them. We do whatever. We shoot our bows, and we're out there, and next thing you know, you know, two hours has gone by, mm -hmm. you know, and we go home, and and we go to the house, and it's like, man, it's nine thirty before we're eating dinner, yep. and we're kind of doing the same thing you're doing. Um, I have this freezer full of meat, and we don't when we're home, we don't go to dinner anymore. Like we eat out on the road so much that when we're home, we literally eat meat patties every night, and we'll do a salad or raw veggies, and that's it. We, we just, we don't, I mean, our grocery list is awesome because mm -hmm. I, we eat the same food. I eat hash browns and ham every morning. We do wilderness athlete protein shakes for lunch and we eat meat patties and veggie for night at dinner. And, and I mean, I, I love the fact that I can hunt and we don't have to worry about where our meat comes from. You know, that we've got it in the freezer and, um, and we will share it this weekend. Like you brought, a, which was a tremendous gift. And I don't know if the people that are here really appreciate you know, the whole sacrifice that you made to make Friday night possible, right? Like that your family made, um, has made to make Friday night possible. You brought a cooler full of bison meat and you served up like... We, we, because you were there too. Well, I just cut meat, okay. Um, you brought meat as well. Well, I know, but you, you brought bison you brought all the fixins for tacos I, and when i heard you were doing that i'm like look i know there's going to be a million people here and i have something to to give i'm i feel like when your cup is overflowing you need to share and mm. that's that's a biblical biblical thing like a lot of people biblically will tithe 10 percent. well if you don't have that 10 percent to tithe how can you still give to people um 
because that's what God wants. You know, you want to share in your harvest. And so for me, I was like, well, if you're doing this, then I'm just going to invite myself. And I brought wild boar sausage and I brought elk. And, you know, we, I just jumped in with you because, um, you know, I, I think that's part of being, if you're going to take, you need to give. And however that looks, you know, everybody's version of giving is different. But the sacrifice that you guys are making, and if you, any of you <laughs> listens to, I won't go too much into Dave Ramsey. I don't want to start on that. But if you, <laughs> I'm, obsessed, I'm obsessed. But if you listen to him, he talks about the sacrifices that people are making, downgrading cars, paying off debt, um, living simpler, living within your means, living under your means. Mm-hmm. So many people don't do that so they can get ahead. So someone might look at you and be like, oh, you just bought 200 acres or riverfront property in Montana, you friggin' brat. I can't afford to do that. Well, yeah, actually you could. Mm-hmm. You've Comes sacrificed. with sacrifice. Yep. You could. There, 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 I come from nothing. If there's like a literally saying. literally nothing. You live like no one else will live so you can live and give like no one else. Yep. That's. It, but it takes time. It takes time. It, takes it doesn't happen overnight. No. And yeah, I mean, for, for what it's worth, like I, growing up, like a single mom, like my yeah. old man was an alcoholic, blah, blah, blah. Don't want to go into the stories. But when I was a kid, I was 12, I think I was 11 years old. My mom gave me $3 to buy shoes at Salvation Army. Yeah. And my buddy, my friend was like, hey, because I didn't have a fishing pole. He's like, hey, buy that fishing pole and I'll run out the back door with the shoes. <laughs> so w- I bought a fishing pole and my buddy stole my tennis shoes for me. But <laughs> We went fishing that summer. It, the, he's past that time where he can be convicted yeah, now. So yeah. we're, we're okay. Statue Statue of limitations. I was 11 years yeah, old. Yeah, you're good. Yeah. You're good. So <laughs> we stole shoes and I bought a fishing pole. Um, I mean, they would have given me the shoes or the pole, yeah. right? But um, but that's how it was. Yeah. Like I had $3 to buy tennis shoes when I was 11 years old and we didn't have anything. Well, I and changed irrigation pipe to earn my school clothes every year at yeah. my parents' place. So I Mowed grew lawn, up working. stack yeah. firewood. Yeah. Like I pushed a lawnmower around yeah. town when I was 12 to... Yeah buy my own clothes yeah. and everything um so, you have so a good i work come, ethic. come from nothing um i was v- we were very blessed that my my step grandpa who i love very much um he invested very well uh when he was working and left my parents with with some money and and uh it wasn't enough to like just go buy a big yeah. ranch by any means but it was enough money that if we were Willing to sacrifice things in you life. You could make it work. That, you know, my mom and stepdad could have lived very comfortably for the rest of their lives and not not done this. Yeah. And not sacrificed anything mm-hmm. um, and been fine. Mm-hmm. But they chose to sacrifice. My mom went from a, they had a 4,000 square foot house. Yeah. Two car garage. Like really nice place. Yeah. My mom's lived in a fifth wheel for over a year now. Yeah. You know, that's a sacrifice. Um it's just what you choose to do with yeah. and what you want out of life, right? Um, I, you know, I, so I invested everything that I've ever earned my entire life. Has always gone into real estate yeah. and in the equity that I've built over the, all the yeah. years. Same as me. I bought my first house when I was 18, yeah. you know, and they've just built that equity. And that's all I've ever had. Yeah. So I was willing to push all my chips to the center of the table to make this happen. And so were my parents. Now, the deal is... We have a ranch payment. Like, there's a payment that has oh, to be for made. Sure. And so, we, m- the deal is, is that my mom is going to help carry that for the first two years. And on the third year, my brother and I are responsible for that payment. Yeah. So, you come hell or high happen. water, we have to make this happen. Yeah. And um, I'm not, I'm not going to fail. Yeah. But, uh, but it's, it's, it's a hell of a sacrifice. Yeah. Talking about cars, like, my pickup's got 350,000 yeah. miles on. It's been, you know. It's uh, nothing pretty. Yeah. You know? Yeah, um, Yogi's is like yeah. two, 220 in his Tacoma, but those yeah. things run forever. So. Yeah, you know, on the excursion, you know, yeah. everything. Like, w- I bought that. It's paid for. Yeah. Um, it's 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 a great tool for what we're doing, you know. Um, we don't have nice, nice fancy s- cars, and um, and I, I don't want that. No. It's not what I want. No. I want to be able to work daylight till dark. I want to spend time with my bison and I want to enjoy good times with good friends and yeah, family. That's why you know, we're here. And share mm-hmm. share the love of bison and the benefits of bison and just kind of change the mindset for the health of the people mm-hmm. and the health of the environment. And well, I can tell you the other night, those tacos that we made. Okay. The, the tacos we made the other night were uh, freaking amazing. Like the meat is amazing and I love the story behind it. And, 
you know, I hope that everybody that's listening to this podcast can feel a little bit into your soul and, and wants to support that small business and is like, hey, man, you know, um, I, I'd like to buy some of this or I'd like to look at how can I be a part of this and or hey maybe you know we're gonna go we want to go glamping <laughs> yeah yep. <laughs> look Come you guys visit. up Come visit. Um, you know and so there's so much to what you're doing and it takes it literally takes um, so much sacrifice you know and and uh, as you know being your friend I mean I want you to be I want everything to happen for you just the way you want it you know and that's cool that that's what I love about events like this is that we're all here and we're all really trying to help each other along, you know, uh, no handouts, hand ups, yep. you know, like, Hey, I'll give you, I'll help you. You're doing this. I'm, I, I'm all in. How can I help you? Where yeah. can I, where can I be your friend and help you? And, um, yeah, that's pretty cool about this whole event. And, and if you guys all haven't been to a tack event, you should come to a tack yeah. event. Tax rad. It's it fun. really is. I mean, it's and you get to shoot your bow. It's you get to shoot your bow on some of the funnest, coolest places on the planet. Yeah. But you know, it's a great community. Yeah. And you know, like to that point, like what you're saying, Sean DeGray and 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 uh, you know, this whole TAC community. Um, you know, it's just I don't know. I'm kind of at a loss for words because the support's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's just unbelievable mm -hmm. and appreciated. And, you know, like you said, hand up and yeah. not hand out. Um, well, yeah, Monica as well. Like Monica is actually really the brains behind the operation. And yeah. We all know that. Um, so, yeah, huge thanks to them mm -hmm. for letting us be here and being a part of their family as well. Yeah, and, yeah this you know. this event has grown. Yeah, I think there was 4,000 people last weekend and there's over 3,000 people up here this weekend. And it's a tremendous community. It's family friendly. Everyone's out here. And um you know, you you look around and you walk around here and you see the vendors that are here supporting the archery community and the hunting community. And it's like, man, those are the people I want to, I want to, when I do spend my money on something, mm -hmm. I want it to be spent with people that really support what we're doing. Dead Downwind Laundry Soap goes far beyond just being unscented. Their liquid laundry soap is my go-to for cleaning up blood and dirt stains especially on items that don't easily fit into the washing machine. The liquid soap works great in your utility sink. Just pour and soak your gear or scrub and spray it off in your driveway. Remove stains, clean and deodorize all in one when you unleash the power of the industry's most effective scent killing enzymes. Dead Down Wind Laundry Soap, check it out. And that's why I'm so excited to be at the Bear Archery Trophy Ridge booth. These guys have been, I mean, Fred Bear, obviously, is the founder. And yep. um, we know what an incredible conservationist and the legacy that he's left behind. And, and shooting for Bear, I feel a, a tremendous responsibility to honor his legacy. Um, and I think being an ethical hunter is part of that. And I think what you're doing goes beyond just hunting. It's, it's sustainable harvest. It's a sustainable lifestyle. And you're teaching something that, that we can all, we can all benefit learning from, which is a little sacrifice, a lot of hard work, and you can make your dreams possible. That's a fact. Yep. Amen. Yeah. And, uh, there's no such thing as an overnight success. I think it comes with uh, dirty hands, <laughs> well-worn boots and a lot of work. Yep. Worn out gloves. Yeah. And I love, I'm like you, man. I, my dream is not living. I, I don't do crowds. Of, I have a really hard time with crowds of people and I come to these events and they're great, but I have, a, I mean, I'm by, I'm just not a whole people person. I'd rather, when I go home, I've, I'd rather lock myself into a, a spot with my mules and like you with your bison and just not come it's out hard for a while. To, it's hard it's to hard, leave it's the hard ranch. It's hard to come out. It's, it's hard to come. I, even, I have to force myself out of that. Yeah. I, I haven't been, I, have, I actually haven't been to attack since uh, pre-COVID. Um, and, you know, all my friends are here, yeah. family here, and it's just been a while. And even that, like, it was like hard to leave. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Well, you I, have so much responsibility. There's a lot going on. I'll, admittedly, while I was gone, um, three or four months ago would have been a different story. But bison got out. They didn't. They got out in an interior fence. They didn't yeah. get out of our place, but got were where they shouldn't have been. Um, and irrigation kind of went south. Oh, you had some. You had and some. so had, there was some drama going on on the ranch, and I'm like, ha deal with it. Yeah. Have fun with that. Like, because yeah. that's what I do. You know. Because my brother's down from Alaska, he's two weeks on, two weeks yeah. off. He works for Alaska, fills ships with oil, um, so he's having to deal with it. Yeah. And I'm just like sitting back, I'm like, 
first break in a year yeah. pretty much Get right you know it. like i didn't even get to hunt last year hardly at all crazy and so i'm just like have fun with that let me know if you need any advice yeah <laughs> it's nice to have it a was break great. it was great nice break yeah. well it's good to see good you to here. see you as well and finally got to meet you i know and there were so many stories that we just oh my god didn't get to today we got off on our farming vice and stuff but we'll get to them on the next one okay because there'll I'll, be a I, part two i want to tell the story about your old house Oh, That's gosh, funny. that story, <laughs> the house, yes, the previous, previous house. The previous, previous? The two houses ago. So you guys oh, have wow. to stay tuned for that. So if people want to find you online, social media, how do they support you and get behind what you're doing? So wild, at Wild Bison Ranch, uh, Instagram, we're starting a TikTok. I'm not good at it. I'm, I up. honestly have been like way why? behind on all social media. Um, and we'll get into also, why we shouldn't do that online. I'm uh, Ty... Uh, underscore K underscore Stubblefields Instagram and we have Facebook pages Wild Bison Ranch and then our website is wildbisonranch.com okay. and we have jerky and meat packages like you can buy grind and steaks and whatnot and we sh do ship you can come to the ranch and pick it up um, so yeah the reason why real quick we do this thing called Harvest Host and uh, we had a, a, a van life girl come the other day Okay, she she's uh, ambassador for buffalo clothing or bison clothing there it's a girl's line of clothing okay and so she was wanting to do all these pictures and stuff well she's got like 50,000 followers on Instagram and 50,000 followers on TikTok anyway she said it's like she was pointing out some of the things about Instagram and the direction they're going yeah and TikTok is not and uh, TikTok is more um fun and still engaging in what probably what instagram used to be and has changed tiktok is so owned by the ccp that's all i gotta yeah. say anyway so that's <laughs> that's why i don't, <laughs> I don't tiktok i don't i just soon freaking move irrigation yeah exactly <laughs> but it, social media is, is a necessary tool it and is. i get it so i yep. won't fault you too much for it but thank you for spending an hour and whatever with me and thank you guys for listening and we uh, like to talk well, we didn't even get started. That's the <laughs> thing. We're like, we're just getting warmed up. <laughs> all right, you guys, check out Ty. Check out Wild Bison Ranch. Thank you all for joining us Thank for you. this episode of the Wild Nut Cut Podcast from Total Archery Channels. Big Sky Montana at the Bear Archery Trophy Ridge booth where we're just kicking back. Love you Enjoying the last time. day. Yeah, love you. I was doing the heart, you know. <laughs> My husband does that. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, you guys. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.